I'm a University of New Hampshire research assistant professor, and I study snow, and I've been skiing for 30 years. This is my 30th year. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about my research today and, and the intersection of climate change and skiing. So we have to start at the beginning. You can tell which one is me. This is myself and my twin sister. I have the dimple, so I'm in blue. Uh, this was shortly before we moved to New Hampshire, right, about a year before, and right before we learned to ski. When we got to Vermont to visit our friends, this was my first mountain. Suicide, anyone else suicide tips? Yes, excellent. I started on the J-bar, right down here at the bottom, right there. And I remember there's, there were three kids, I have an older sister too, two parents, right? So they teach us how to ski, no poles, you're in a pizza pie, you're screaming down the mountain, right? Ah! And your parents are at the bottom, like, all right, you get Jesse, you get Lizzie, I'll get Katie. And by the end of the season, we had conquered the face, right? If anyone who's been to Suicide Six, that's, that's what you're shooting for by the end of your first year learning to ski. My first ski club, McIntyre, in beautiful Manchester, Vegas, New Hampshire. Most people don't know that there is a ski resort in Manchester, New Hampshire, our Queen City. My twin sister, um, for the, about five years, she was the Leslie Dope of Manchester, New Hampshire, literally. So she worked in Parks and Rec, and she had the inside scoop on this mountain. It's not exactly a moneymaker. This is no Vail, this is no Aspen. But it plays a very important role in the New Hampshire ski economy, because this is where kids learn. This is where we go to grow our love for the sport. I remember many, many nights coming home from ski club, and it was my favorite night of the week. In 1995, oh, sorry, 93 to 95, that's when I learned to snowboard. I haven't gone back. I still snowboard today. And that was at Pat's Peak. The last time I was at Pat's Peak was about five years ago for my friend's fall wedding. And this is part of the climate change story. Many resorts, as you'll see, are adapting to a shifting the climate, and they're adjusting their business models. We'll get to that. When I think about those mountains, all of them are still in operation. But there's 600 other mountains, little resorts, some of them mom and pop shops, some of them just the tiny little hill that was in the community and had one rope tow and one trail. 600 of those have been lost. They're no longer open. We have less than 500 remaining across the US now. Some of them were small, some of them were big. Some of them were the Escutneys, right? Some of them were the Maple Valleys, a little bit of a larger impact to their communities. And a lot of this, you know, some of it has to do with climate, some of it has to do with how they're operated. But this is a major driving factor. So what you're looking at here is a map of temperature change in the United States since 1970, so within our lifetime, most of us. Right? Anywhere you're seeing those dark red colors, it's warmed a lot faster, on the order of about one to one and a half degrees Fahrenheit per decade. So going back to 1970, that means five to six degrees warmer than when many of you were growing up here. Do you see any blue in the map? No, that means no regions in the United States are cooling in winter. All of them are warming. And the Northeast is getting hit particularly hard. We've seen other changes that coincide with this change in temperature. We have fewer days of snow cover. This was actually my graduate student project when I was at University of New Hampshire in 2005. It's about one to two weeks, depending on where you're on the state. That's one to two fewer weeks that we can go skiing. Yeah, everyone makes me angry. We're also seeing our lakes, our rivers, our streams icing out earlier. And we're also seeing fewer days with snow and more with midwinter rain. Did you guys see that this winter? 1617, this past, or sorry, 1718, this past winter, I was measuring snow in New Hampshire, and there were days in February where I had to go out to an empty field site and say, all right, be a hero, we're four to zero. That's what we say in the biz. And a lot of this is all driven by changes in carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is a very important greenhouse gas in our atmosphere. Without it, we would be a frozen ice ball planet. With it, we have liquid water, we have oceans, we have rivers, lakes, and streams. But it's increasing. When I started skiing in Suicide Six, it was 351 parts per million. On a million parts of air in any given parcel, 300 of them, or 350 of them, would have been carbon dioxide. By the time I started learning to snowboard at Pat's Peak, we were up to 360 parts per million. When I started my graduate student project 
in 2005. 380 parts per million was what I had to memorize for my exams. And today, now that I teach global environmental change at the University of New Hampshire, my students just took their final exam. At the beginning of the semester, I had used 405 parts per million, we're up to 410 parts per million. And it's not stopping, it's gonna keep going up. Within our lifetime, we're very much expected to reach 500 parts per million, possibly 800. And you can imagine what changes we've already seen in winter are going to continue into the future. And this affects us, it affects our local economy. In New Hampshire, our northernmost counties get 45% of their visitor spending comes from the ski industry. This is a big chunk of change. When you look at the entire United States, aggregated, $11.3 billion spent on skiing alone. Some of this is direct spending at the resorts themselves, so buying a lift ticket, getting a hotel or a condo on the mountain that's owned by the resort. Some of it's the indirect spending. Maybe after a long day of skiing, you go to the restaurant down the way, or you decide to buy a pair of skis or a new hat down at the ski shop that's off the resort property. And most importantly is the induced impact. That looks really what happens in New Hampshire, right? If you own a restaurant, if you own a gas station or a grocery store, the money that all of your friends are earning because of the ski industry then gets spent in your community. And if you're having a really bad year, like 2015-16, doesn't everyone remember that winter? For us, that was the winter that wasn't. It was eight degrees above average. We had 45 days of snow cover in Durham, New Hampshire. We typically have 90. It was halved that year. In addition to the spending, we're supporting 191,000 jobs across the US. And you can see this spatially. New Hampshire's kind of a pipsqueak when we compare ourselves to Colorado. This is the number of jobs in our state, and then this is just for a snapshot in time. This is for 2015 and 16, so a relatively bad year. You could probably inflate these by a couple thousand in New Hampshire, up to 7,000, 9,000 jobs in a good year. In Colorado, 43,000 jobs supported by the ski industry. When you look at how much money gets spent, it's well over $300 million in New Hampshire. This makes a big difference to our northern counties, where most of our ski resorts are. It also makes a difference for the folks that are benefiting from the traffic coming north, although it can be a pain to commute back home. What I did in my research was to take a look at how those bad winters impact the bottom line. So you can look at the top five years, right, our best years. When we have a really good year relative to the 2001 to 2016 average, so a long-term span, those top five years bring in an extra $692 million. And they support 11,800 more jobs compared to the average years. In the bad years, however, the 2015-16, the 2011-2012s, that's when we see a decrease on the order of about a billion dollars. And we see over 17,000 fewer jobs. And what's remarkable about these numbers is that this is well within the era of snowmaking. Right? We've adapted. We've improved our snowmaking substantially. Ski resorts have done so much to change this changing landscape. This is what we looked at for a historical area of snow cover, like 30 days or more, so at least a month of continuous snow cover. This is what it looked like from 1960 to 1990, on average, right? well into West Virginia. My parents actually learned to ski in West Virginia. Um, they've actually seen quite a decline in their skier visitation in recent years. New Hampshire, the entire state would see at least a month of continuous snow cover. We can use climate models to project into the future what that's going to look like, and it's not very pleasant. If we continue to burn fossil fuels and add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere at the same pace we've been doing it, this is what we can expect. Only the Adirondacks, the uh, Adirondacks, the Green Mountain, White Mountains, and the northernmost reaches of Maine. McIntyre doesn't have very much of a future in this one. If we were to reduce carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and reduce the burning of fossil fuels, it would look a lot better than this. Somewhere down in Massachusetts, they would still have at least a month of snow cover. The good news is that the resorts are doing a lot to adapt. So one, I've mentioned snowmaking. Right? I've also mentioned the four-season business model. Right? This, a lot of resorts actually started out as four-season resorts, and they found that they could actually make quite a bit more money in winter back in the day, but today that's shifting. Now it's more about weddings in summer, fun runs, reunions, music festivals. Some resorts out west are making more money in summer than they are in winter now. But that doesn't really 
really address the full story. One thing that resorts are doing is they're also reducing their own footprints, right? So their carbon footprints, how much they're contributing to the problem. They don't want to be part of the problem. They want to be part of the solution. Truckee, California, Salt Lake City, Aspen, Colorado, Breckenridge, even Burlington, Vermont. These are all towns that benefit from the ski industry in all towns that have reduced, that are committed to reducing their carbon footprint by going 100% renewable by 2020 or 2025. University of New Hampshire, the campus itself, is already 100% renewable. That's commitment. And that's demonstrating change in how we can address the problem. And that affects our bottom line, which is great and all. But there's also another impact of climate change that I just want to introduce to you. And it's called solastalgia. This is the psychological impact of climate change. It's derived from the word solace, right? The comfort you get from being at home. And nostalgia, that homesickness you feel when it's changed. Solastalgia is the feeling, that sense of unease you get when your environment is changing around you. When you walk around in North Conway and it's 70 degrees and you're wearing t-shirts and shorts, and you're looking outside and you're like, it's, it's February. This feels weird. The sun's too low in the sky for me to agree to be 70 degrees. And it's a loss. It's something that you, you can't really put your finger on it because it doesn't have a dollar value associated with it. And so for, for this past winter, my son, for a variety of reasons, he couldn't go outside. He was stuck inside for the winter. Um, so to address this, he really wanted to go so sledding. He really wanted to go a snowman. He was so looking forward to that, he couldn't. So we brought the snow inside, and he made a snowman inside. And this, to me, is what you cannot put a price on. So with that. <laughs>